Welcome to our volunteer respite training. My name is Pam Sablan, Executive Director for the CNMI Council on Developmental Disabilities. Before we begin, I want to say thank you to our partners to, that made this event possible. NFC said Mr. Floyd Mosca, and our partners at DCCA, Mr. Jack Sablan and his staff, Regina and Frylon, and of course my staff, Ruth, Pangina, Lillian, Ada, and Radius. He's not here, but he'll be here shortly. So um, I'm going to introduce our guest presenter, Miss um, Mary Jo Caruso, who came all the way from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Actually, she lives close by, right? She's our trainer for today. And um, can you please help me wish her a warm holiday in Tiro? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for all being here. I said, everybody's so on time. And they said, well, they're mostly students. Um, so I get that. Although when I was a student, I used to say, I would look outside and say, it's cloudy, I can't go to class. Or it's windy, I can't go to class. Um, but I did go to class. Okay. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I ran a respite program for two decades using volunteers uh, to provide support to people with disabilities. Um, so what I'm coming today is to prepare you and then also model so that we can continue to engage and encourage and prepare volunteers to provide support. Uh, to people with disabilities, children with autism, individuals with developmental disabilities, uh, folks who are aging, and things like that. So I'll be asking you um, a lot of opportunities, you'll have a lot of opportunities to really think about how you can use your gift of time, uh, because it really is a gift. Uh, if you are working and you're busy, or if you're committed to things in your community, or you're a student, you know that time is limited, right? So how many people were probably a little sleepy when they got up this morning? Yeah, see? Um, because you have limited time. So we know that your time is a gift, and we want to place that gift in the place where it can make the most impact. Not only to you, but to the person that you're providing some support to. And providing support to family members who are caring for individuals who have bigger needs um, is a really important thing because family caregivers rarely take care of themselves first. They take care of everybody else. Um, but what happens when you take care of everybody else and you don't take care of you is one day you might not be around to provide that kind of care. So we want to make sure that our family caregivers are well supported to do the work that they do and to provide the love and care that they provide. Um, and also that the individual who needs help um, that they have a good time too, that they have a break from the day-to-day -day, um, pieces of their life. So when you came in, everybody should have gotten a yellow training binder. So if you have it, um, you want to pull that out. It is yours. You're going to keep it. You're going to write in it. It's going to be um, yours forever. And uh, if you don't have one, raise your hand let us know. Um, you do not have one? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, but you need one too. So we need a couple of training handles. Um, it's set up in a unique way. So I'm going to walk you through it. There's a left pocket, and in that pocket is everything I'm going to have you sign as we go through the process of today. But I'm going to ask you not to sign anything yet. So keep everything in there. Um, I don't want you to sign anything until we review it and discuss it, but you will be going through and signing everything. The middle part of your folder, that's all of your learning content. That's the material that we're going to go through today. That's yours, write in it, do whatever you want. And then there's a right pocket, and in that right pocket are some forms that you may never use. They're liability forms, they're incident forms, there's some other types of forms, and that's okay. Um, we want you to have them if you need them, uh, but not necessarily use them if you don't need them. So that's your training folder, and I need you to hang on to that. And everyone should have gotten
gotten an index card. And I want you to take that index card and take it out. And on the front of the index card, I want you to put your contact information. Right? Your full name printed so we can read it. Um, your address, your telephone number or cell phone number or both. An email address. All of the ways that we could contact you. And then I want you to put a star next to the best way that you like contacting. Do you like to be texted, emailed, called? And it's okay to pick your preference. My friends will tell you that I'm not a talker on the phone. I will text you any day of the week, but if I'm, you know, it's a big situation if I'm going to talk to you. So just take that index card and put all of your contact information and print as clearly as you can. Regina will really appreciate that about you later um, when she can read all of that. Name, address, telephone number, email, best way to contact you. So you're going to hold on to that index card and you're going to hold on to that pre-service survey. You're going to stick it back in your left-hand pocket. Um, and when we're all done today and everything in your left-hand pocket is all signed, we're going to have you clip it together and turn it in in order to get your certificate for training. So let me talk to you a little bit about our day, our morning together is going to look like. Um, it's going to be wonderful. It's a great opportunity to help you think about spending time providing relief to caregivers. It's a great time for you to share what you know and ask any questions. So you're going to notice that your training manual has all sorts of tabs in it. We're going to be moving to different segments. And each one is going to cover a different topic or area uh, that I think is important for you to consider and start to have a conversation about before you provide respite care. Uh, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand as we're asking it. I'd rather stop and pause and make sure that we are talking about things that we're all comfortable and familiar with um, before we move on. So um, we will be taking some breaks today, but just so you know, the restrooms are back there. Uh, the refreshments and the fruit are over there. You're free to get up at any time that you want. Um, please don't wait for me to take a formal break if you want to get up and move around. We will also be having lunch as a part of the training. So lunch isn't something you have to stay afterwards for. It's actually going to be a part of our training day, and we're going to keep sort of working right through it. Um, so at the point where we can take that break, I'll let you know. You're going to go out and get your food. You're going to get it, bring it back in here, and then we're going to keep right on working so that you're out at the time that you expect to be out. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Okay. Um, so if you look in your training binder, um, you have a training agenda that basically covers everything we're going to talk about today. We're going to, you know, we're already welcoming you. I hope you feel welcome um, to being a part of today, and you've done your pre-session questionnaire. We're going to talk about the families that we're providing support to, and spend some time um, thinking about your rights as a volunteer and your responsibilities. So your rights as a volunteer are the things that you can do, the things you could be doing within your volunteer role. Your responsibilities are the things that you must do in order to maintain being a good volunteer and providing quality care. Um, we're going to talk about supporting the person, and we're going to talk about person-first language, which is um, something that is familiar to some of us, but not to all of us. We're going to spend some time doing some problem solving, too, um, and engaging the person in the respite environment and then talking about the volunteer policies and next steps. I want you, by the time we leave, at the end of the day, and I hand you a paper clip and you clip together all of your signed papers and you give them to Regina and get your certificate, you should have a sense of what's next, right? What, what's going to happen next for me? Um, there is nothing worse than getting an excited volunteer who doesn't know what to do with their time. So we will uh, be talking about some possible volunteer options and then taking any of your questions. So what I want you to do right now is you have that index card where you put all of your contact information. I'm going to ask you to pull it out again. And on the back of that card, 
I want you to think about something. I want you to think about if you were asked to volunteer to provide respite for an individual with a disability, support need, who is aging, what do you see your, who do you see yourself volunteering with? Ideally, if I were to take you and say, okay, it's time to go volunteer at two o'clock this afternoon, you, you have the opportunity to spend time with someone, who would that person be? What would they, what would their support needs look like? What might you be doing as a volunteer? So I want you to think about things, and this is not gonna lock you into anything. I just wanna get a sense of what you're considering as a respite volunteer right now. We're gonna come back and revisit this question before we leave today, and we may even revisit it before you're ever matched in the respite environment. Um, but I want you to think about who are you volunteering with? Are you tied into a specific disability? A specific age group? An environment? Will you be um, preferring to volunteer in a center? or somewhere else in the community, or supporting someone um, in their home environment. So just take a few minutes and write down, if you were volunteering today as a respite worker, what do you imagine yourself doing? Who do you imagine yourself doing it with? So now I want to take a moment, and if this is a big group, so keep that in mind, it's a little bit bigger than sometimes I have the opportunity to train. So I want you to stand up when you get your turn, introduce yourself, and I want you to tell us something about yourself that you think is true of only you in the room, um, or true for very other few people in the room. So to say that you're a student isn't gonna cut it, because I'm looking around and I think quite a few of you are students. Um, but if I had my opportunity, I would say that I'm Mary Jo Caruso, and I'm here to be the trainer, and I have six children. So I think that that's probably true of not a lot of people in the room. I have a blended family of four children and two stepchildren, so we have six. Um, five boys and one girl. So, um, you know, that, that would be my thing. That's true only of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, to make it easier, since it is a big group, I'm going to hand the microphone around. I just want you to quickly, ooh, we've got one over there, stand up, introduce yourself, and say something that you think is sort of unique to you. Hi, my name is Good morning. My name is Taylor Kababa. I am I'm here, I'm a volunteer. I am volunteer uh, to write in the church. I have three kids, three boys, and six grandkids. Great, thank you. Good morning, I'm Jenny Liss, and I have really long hair. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Matthew Burke. I'm with the CYS. I love fitness. I thought you were going to say you have no hair compared to your long hair. That would be really good. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sarah Kia. Um, I work for You Said at NBC. Um, I'm pretty much sure that I'm the only one that should jump out of the Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kia Sarah, I volunteer at Center for Living Independent, where my sister is one of the consumers, and I've been there for four years till now. So I help uh, her and others as well on a three times a week program. So, yeah, excuse me. Hi, my name is Gertie, and I'm here as a volunteer from the nursing, um, for the, for the nursing department, um, and and something that is, that I think is only for me is that 
Um, I'm a foreign student and my first day is that May 3, 16-year-old brother with autism. Oh, my name is Mark Regis, and I'm a medical student. And I'm here to learn about respite care as well, and I'm going to show what he is and let's make that school. Hi, I'm Joan, and I'm an intense nursing student, and of course I'm a very so proper here, rest here, and a little bit of and I'm an interested in the here right now, it's really a little bit My name is Jackie Lewis, I'm for Ah, something unique about you. Something, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Minda Conception Chorus, I'm a uh, program coordinator for a national family caregiver support program at the Office of Aging. What's uh, just for me is uh, I don't need four court leave for the past 31 years, so. And 
was, uh, what else? Well, I worked in the same department with my wife at the other company. And what's unique about that is she's my wife at work, and she's also my, I mean, she's my boss at work. <laughs> She's my wife, my boss at work, and at home, she's, she's only the boss. <laughs> okay, my name is Lori Lossom, I'm an NCUC director. Uh, I'm from Saigon, and I, I do have some Panamanian blood, and I'm also part of the same clan that Johnny's in. Uh, something interesting about myself, which I mentioned uh, yesterday, was just I collect a lot of stuff. <laughs> My name is Emmy Bonello. I'm one of the instructors of the students here. I don't have any children. I was born in the 50s. I fell into the <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So hi. My name is Rosalind Lecho. You. you might need you to stand next to me to verify that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly. I'm also a nursing student. I hope to learn, to learn more knowledge regarding rescue care for today. And something weird but interesting fact about myself is that um, I love eating ice chips, but I'm bored and also as a stretchy. <laughs> I like how you process it by weird, just so we can decide for ourselves. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kaiser Lucido, and I am an NMC nursing student. Um, the one thing unique about me is that I think I'm the only person named Kaiser <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Christine. I'm a second year nursing student. And something unique about me, but I think maybe a few other people have tried, is sledding in the mountains of Japan. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Boris. I'm a NMC nursing student. Something unique about me is I am adopted and I have 12 adopted siblings. Um, hello, my name is Angela Nakuma. I'm a second um, year student here at NFC. And something that is true of me that is like the only truth to me is that as of right now I have seven lipsticks in my bag. <laughs> I'm here because I want 
to learn more about respite care and how it could be in my community. And also something that's true of me, maybe most of you also, I like to travel even though I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, good morning. My name is Hannah Alcorto and I'm also a senior year nursing student. And I would very much like to learn more about respite care and what that care entails. And something unique about me, but also unique about, I'm pretty sure one other person in this room is, I also do not eat wheat or other land animals for about maybe more than five years now. I'm Lady Santasha Kinova. I'm here to learn more about our care and something that is true of me, that is like the only truth of me, is I am half tomorrow, half for me. Good morning everyone, my name is Nico and I'm from Tinet. I'm here to learn more about uh, respite care and something that's unique about me is uh, since I'm from Tinet, they have too much cows and I have also almost got attacked by two cows <laughs> so, and then from there I learned that uh, you guys ever get uh, charged by cows so I'll hide behind bushes or climb trees <laughs> charge in the bush <laughs> I'm a second-year nursing student, and something that's unique about me is that I don't have a driver's license, I don't know how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Joan Kekomi Dehut as well. Um, I'm a second-year nursing student. I'm here to learn about more about aspect care. And something unique about me, I believe, is I am <laughs> Good morning everybody. My name is Carlan Camacho. Uh, this is my 11 year in the government. I work under DCCA and now um, I'm joining a respite care program. And um, something unique about me is that I have a bedridden mother. So this drives me to keep going and learn more about respite care. Good morning again I have a daughter and a son who were born in Arizona. They're desert babies, but they love the island and they can speak to more. So. <laughs> good. good morning, everyone. My name is Shine Gorha from Affairs. Um, something unique about me is that when I, I have a two year old toddler girl, and when I was pregnant in my first trimester, the doctor said she was gonna, she would, might have um, spinal bifida. So throughout my pregnancy, I was researching and trying to figure out um, how to be a mother with a uh, child with special needs. So after that, it's been uh, really a goal of me to kind of work with that and um, see how we can help other parents and families in that. My name is Yala, uh, I'm a nursing student, 13 years. Uh, I'm Chinese, I speak Chinese and English. I'm the only child of my family, and I married a husband, also the only child of the family, who so have four aging parents. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sahaina. I'm also a second year nursing student. Um, something true about me is that I am the only child that Two of my classmates are super three of my classmates as well. Um, something uh, only true for me is that my name is Lahaina, it's actually from Hawaii, it's the capital of Hawaii. Good morning, my name is Hada Kimura, I'm a second year nursing student, and one fact of Bobby that may be true to others are, I mean, is that I'm a left handed. And I've been laughing at the tennis racket when I was a kid and I just kept laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Chris. I am a nursing student. I also work at CHC and I currently hold a uh, licensed psychiatric technician. Hello, good morning. I'm Ernest Javier. I'm a second year nursing student. 
And also, I am a nurse in the psychiatric unit. Hi, good morning. I'm Rocky Ampe in Hawaii. Uh, I have two kids, uh, one 16 and one four years old, that has some special needs. That's why uh, I really love to learn more about children with disabilities. Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Torrey. I just noticed <laughs> me and Raquel are the only CWs here, and I'm here to uh, learn about uh, risk and care, but I don't have any idea yet about this. <laughs> and I have three children as well. I have one boy and two kids and two grand boys. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Villanueva from the UIS, and uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm also a uh, I have uh, three e-books lo loading in uh, Amazon Kindle. <laughs> I won't tell you my, my alias. And uh, I'm, I'm third runner of 2015, seeing my bad talent, and, but please don't be missing. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm a small business owner, but I'm a small business, but I'm at least a small business. Thank you so much for that. I do it for a lot of reasons. Um, not because I'm going to remember everybody's name. I probably can't get past the first table. But I do it because uh, we're all here for a common purpose, to learn more about respite care, to become respite volunteers. But there's also really fun and unique things about us. Like, I know that if I want to consider jumping out of an airplane, which I don't, I'll probably be back at that table talking to someone. I know that um, I too have a passion about lipsticks and I might be over there chatting up with someone. I want to see your engagement ring um, during a break, you know, that's pretty exciting to me. I want to hear more about people's family members. So there are unique things about us that really connect each of us as well. Um, and that's what I want you to think about with respite and volunteering. It's not just about what you're giving. And it's not just about what the families are getting. It's about connecting with people that you genuinely enjoy spending time with. Because when you genuinely enjoy doing something, the chance of you going back and doing it is so much higher. It doesn't matter if you're paid. It doesn't matter if it's hours towards a class. It's because you genuinely want to spend time with, with that individual and you get a lot out of it. And you will find yourself, here's been my experience in the last two decades of providing respite care um, and running a program is our families, hands down, talk about how much they appreciate that volunteer and that opportunity to have meaningful time to do some other things, whatever that other thing is that the family needs to accomplish. But my volunteers talk about how this is a life-changing experience for them. How it absolutely helps them see things differently. If you're a parent or a family caregiver, the opportunity to give that gift to someone else is tremendous for you. It's very fulfilling. It's very rewarding. If you're a student and you're thinking about doing clinical work in a hospital or an office setting, you need to get into family homes to see what life is really like to care for that person. Because in a clinical or a hospital environment, it's so easy to say, do this three times a day. Or we want you to spend X amount of time doing this. And until you spend time with families, walking next to them, you'll never be in their shoes, right? But you can walk next to them and walk with them. How can we say, do this, this, and this? So, um, in, in Pittsburgh, we have therapeutic staff support workers and they spend time with children with autism. And it's supposed to be 80% teachable time, which means they're not there to provide respite. They're not there um, to let the parent leave the child. They're supposed to be teaching the family how to engage with their child with mental health issues so that when the staff person's not there, the parent can be more successful. So I get the model, not challenging model. But for our families, they don't often get a break. They get teachable time, and then they get time with their child on their own. And they don't often get time outside of work or other responsibilities to have time for themselves. 
And one of the things that um, the therapeutic staff support responsibility was, was to teach the families how to grocery shop with their child with autism. I don't like to grocery shop with my children at all. Right? Because they're always throwing things in the cart that I don't want. They always want those little thin Oreos with a big filling. Um, you know, and so for me, it's very stressful to grocery shop with my child. And I don't care how teachable you make it, it's very stressful. So what we started to realize is families need the opportunity to have opportunities to learn how to better engage and support their child, those teachable moments. But they also needed those opportunities to just do what they needed to do to get done. And maybe it's to take a walk. Maybe it's to grocery shop. Maybe it's to do something else. And for those of you, especially that are students, to take that opportunity and spend that time walking next to people will help you be a better clinician. It will help you be better in a hospital setting or a clinical setting or an office setting because you will truly begin to appreciate that when that person's not there with you, receiving care or training or support, they've got to do it all on their own. And not only are they doing it all on their own, they're doing it while they're trying to do everything else, right? Um, prepare food, run a household, grocery shop, um, manage their family's other needs. Most of us have multiple other responsibilities. And on top of that, um, we need to provide caregiving. So in addition to running a, a program that provided volunteer respite program um, volunteers, I also am a caregiver. And so I would um, spend my time working, and then I would go care for my mother, and then I'd go back to work, and then I would care for my mother. And I would be doing her personal care, and I would be feeding, cooking, and feeding, and cleaning up. And then guess what? I'd get home, and it would be late, and I'd be tired, and what I got to do is prepare food and cook and clean up and do laundry. And again, not because my family wasn't helpful, but we all had multiple, multiple responsibilities. And on top of mine, I was also caregiving. Um, it was a great gift to be able to care for my mom in the last three years of her life, but I, it was not always easy. And there were many nights when I was very tired and many mornings when I was very tired and many times when I cried and just wanted to, to not be so hard. I didn't want it to end because I knew that when it ended, typically it meant because she wasn't with us anymore. Um, she wasn't going to get better. But I just didn't want it to be so hard. So I needed people like you. I needed that person who could come in and sit and watch Jeopardy with my mom. And that was one of her big things, Jeopardy. She would always say, if I could just have a little bit more time and a few more clues, I think I can answer that. And I said, well, that's really not the purpose of the game. But I gotcha. You know, I understand it. Um, but to have those people who could come in and do those things so that I could be a mom and a wife and an employee and also my mother's daughter as well as her caregiver. So with that in mind, what is respite? And I'm, I won't call on anyone specifically. You can just shout it out. When you think of respite, what do you think of? Shout it out a little louder. Release. Okay. What else do you think of? Rest. Rest. Help. Help. What else? Time out. Recess. Care. Care. I mean, one or two more. Is there a break on there? Is there a break on there? Break? Break? A breather? <laughs> break. So let's just take a look at this for a minute, right? You are the family member. You get relief. You get rest. You get help. Who would want a timeout? You know, when you think about sports games, when they, you know, I, I come from a big sports community, um, the Steelers, their little football team, that, you know, um, and, and the Penguins, they're just a little hockey team. Um, 
when they need a break, they, they call a timeout, right? That helps them regroup so that they can win the game. Nobody wins the game or gets to the finish line by just going and going and going and going. That timeout serves a purpose, and that purpose might be to get that, that breather, to get that break. It also might mean to regroup and to re-strategize to think about how you're going to do what you're doing. Um, it's a recess, too. Who remembers recess growing up? Recess was fun, right? That was the time when you got to stop studying for a little bit and you got to have a good time. Guess what? The person who is providing the care needs to have fun and strategize and get some help and rest and all of these things. So does the person who's the care recipient. They want to have fun too. They need a break from the day-to-day -day grind. Kids with autism or developmental disabilities who get a lot of therapies and a lot of schooling, that's a lot of work. That's their job when they're little. But it's grueling, and they want a break too. They want to do something fun. My mom would be the first person to tell you if she were here today that she needed a break from me as much as I needed a break from her. Right? So when you flip to um, your training manual, and if you go to page seven, you're going to see what is respite, right? And respite is all of these things that you talked about, and even a little bit more. Uh, respite is now part of a public law in our country. The public law provides for the infrastructure to get the work done, the care done. It does not provide for the care itself. So it's not that the legislation doesn't say we are entitled to have respite care. The legislation says we support activities like this, the opportunity to advance awareness, to promote volunteerism, and to promote uh, a growing number of people who are committed to caregiver relief. So especially for those of you who are students, I would hope that once your student life ends and you're professionally employed, that that doesn't stop your commitment to raising awareness, to promoting support, to things like that. Um, there's an incredible benefit uh, to both the care recipient and the care provider, and that's across age, across disability. So this isn't something that's just for children, it's not something new, that's just for individuals who are elderly, but it is for individuals who need care above and beyond the typical support. So when we talk about that care and that break and that breather, we're talking about people who have long-term or maybe lifelong support needs. And not that it's all gloom and doom, but there are times when those support needs become harder. You know, for me to travel and to work in the last seven weeks, I have been in four countries and three different continents. So for me to do things like that when my mother was living took an incredible amount of organization on my part. Uh, and especially in Pittsburgh, it snows. It's snowing in Pittsburgh this week. Um, I needed to rely on care providers who could get to her even if the roads were bad. So, you know, it's, it's ebb and flow. I don't need that type of support all the time, especially when I'm in town, but I do need it when, I'm, when I leave town. So we, you know, when we think about the benefit to people, we have to think about the benefit in terms of where they are in their life right now. Sometimes parenting or caring for an individual in a certain part of a life that in a lifetime is different and more difficult than others. Um, and volunteer services help because it helps families develop coping strategies. There's nothing better than having someone come in and enjoy your family member. It is really rewarding as a family member to see somebody come in when my children were growing up. Um, I have a child with some sensory integration issues who was very difficult at certain points in his life. He was very wary for me. And there was, it was wonderful to have a care provider come into my home and say to him and to the other kids, let's make a cake. I would love to make a cake with my child, but I was tired. I was just tired, and the thought of making a cake just would have pushed me over the edge. But she came in with energy every week, and she would do things with the kids that engaged them and gave me a break, and they enjoyed it too. And for me to be able to see my kids enjoying 
life through somebody else was absolutely wonderful. She also introduced them to other people and other things that I wouldn't even think about. They would go hiking through the woods. They would go out and try new things. She belonged to a faith organization that was different than mine, um, but they did some more fun things in our Catholic church were just not as much fun as like the other church down the street. And so she would take them to some of the youth activities and they would have a wonderful time. So there's something to seeing your family member grow through someone else's experiences and give them opportunities. Um, it also strengthened our family well-being. I was when I was caring for my mom, I was not always the best mother and wife and coworker, and just having somebody come in gave me the opportunity to be a better spouse. It gave me the opportunity to be a better family member. And we're not naive. We don't say that respite care prevents bad things from happening. It doesn't prevent hospitalization. It does not take cancer away from someone. It doesn't prevent us from sometimes throwing up our hands and saying, we just can't do it anymore. What it does, though, is it gives us the opportunity to step back and make better decisions about our family and our loved one. So with that in mind, for example, none of us makes good decisions all the time if we're constantly stressed. But we can make better decisions if we have that chance to take a breath and step back. So if you look at page 28 in your manual, you're going to see a pretty cool graphic. And that graphic talks about why respite care is so important. And it's important because it empowers families, Right? It reduces family stress. Just you being there, just your presence, it increases opportunities for families to stay involved in their community. It improves their caregiver attitudes towards caregiving. I feel better about taking care of my mom when I have a break from caring for her. And I'm, I'm sorry, it is not page 28, it is page 8. I'm going to, oh, I, I apologize for that. I got ahead of myself. Um, and finally, it gives the families a chance to make better, safer decisions. And that's what it's all about. We are not going to put outcomes on respite that we can't um, absolutely prove. But what we can say is, coming into my life, the women that helped my mom so that I could travel, helped me step back and make safer and better decisions about her. And my mom was not easy. My mom was not easy at all. She was a strict disciplinarian of five children growing up. Um, we always had, to call them chores to do would be probably to minimize the work environment that we had at home and had at school and were active in our community and we worked. Um, and so my mom was not an easy aging person. So I didn't, I didn't color it with a lot of beauty when I put out an ad for her, um, when I was looking for somebody to help out. I didn't say like, delightful little old lady, you know, who um, just wants to, to knit and share stories and, and smile all afternoon. I just said, um, she, you know, my mom, who uh, beautifully and gracefully raised five children in a very structured environment, loves to play bingo, watch Jeopardy, and get out in the community. If you're looking for sunshine on a, on a gloomy day, this is not the woman for you. Um, and if you're looking for the silver lining in the cloud, you're not going to find it with her. But you will find honesty and um, a woman who can accept your help even if she's telling you in that moment she can't appreciate it. And out of that, we got, I think, 17 or 19 applications of people who wanted to spend time with her. And we found three lovely women who loved to cook and introduce her to a variety of foods, which my mom was a foodie, so she loved. Um, but also three women who knew that they were not going to get constant thank yous from her in word. Um, she would say things when you walked in the door like, I don't know why you're here today. And the caregivers would know that that meant that she was recognizing that they were there and they were okay with that. So um, in, in knowing that I picked people for my mom to be there when I couldn't, it really gave me the chance to step back and make really good decisions regarding her care. So with that in mind, I want you to, um, we're gonna start to think a little bit about what families go through because 
Um, even if we're the family of a young child today with a disability or we're caring for an aging parent or a spouse, it's hard to imagine um, the different things that uh, family members go through. And I want to start with the first piece, and it's called Amsterdam International. And um, it really talks about what happens when your life doesn't go immediately as planned. And I'm going to read it aloud to you um, just to kick us off this morning. Amsterdam International. Parents of normal kids who are friends with parents of kids with special needs often say things like, wow, how do you do it? I wouldn't be able to handle everything. You guys are amazing. Well, thank you so very much. But there's no special manual, no magical positive attitude serum, no guide or bodily strength and serenity. People just do what they have to do. You rise to the occasion and embrace your sense of humor or grow a new one. You come to love your life and it's hard to imagine in a different way, although when you try, it may sting a little. But things weren't always like this. At first, you ricochet around the stages of grief and it was hard to see the sun through the clouds. And forget the damn tulips or windmills. In the beginning, you're stuck in Amsterdam International Airport. You briskly walk off the plane into the airport thinking, there must be a way to fix this. Please, please don't make me have to stay there. This isn't what I wanted. Please just take it back. The airport is covered with signs in Dutch that don't help and several well-meaning airport professionals trying to calm you into realizing that you are here. Oh, and since they're shutting down the airport today, you can never leave. Never. Never. This is your new reality. Their tone and smiles are reassuring and for a moment you feel a little bit more calm, but in the pit in your stomach doesn't leave and a new wave of panic isn't far off. And although you don't know it yet, this will become a pattern. You will often come to a place of almost acceptance, only to quickly re become devastated or infuriated about this unfair deviation in Holland. At first, it will happen several times a day, and it will taper to several times a week, and then only occasionally. A flash of realization. Your family and friends are waiting, some in Italy, some back home, all wanting to hear about your arrival in Rome. Now what is there to say? And how do you say it? You settle in leaving an outgoing voicemail that says we've arrived, the flight was fine, more news to come. Because really, what else can you say? You're not even sure what to tell yourself about Holland, let alone your loved ones. And although you don't know it yet, this will become a pattern. How can you talk to people about Holland? If they sweetly offer reassurances, it's hard to comfort them. They've never been to Holland, after all. And after their attempts at sympathy, while genuine, you don't really need their pity. Their pity says, wow, things must really suck for you. And when you're just trying to hold it together, that doesn't help. When you hear someone else say things are bad, it's hard to maintain your denial, to keep up your everything is just fine, thank you so very much, outer shell. Pity hits too close to home. And you can't admit to yourself how terrible it feels to be stuck in Holland, because then you'll undoubtedly collapse into a pile of raw, wailing agony. So you have to deflect and hold yourself together. Deflect and hold yourself together. You sneak sideway glances at your travel companions who also were ready for Italy. You have no idea how he or she is handling this massive change in plans and can't bring yourself to ask. You think, please, please, don't leave me here. Stay with me. We can find the right things to say to each other, I think. Maybe we can have a good life here, but the terror of mutual breakdown, of admitting that you're deep in a pit of raw misery, of saying it out loud and thereby making it reality, is too strong. So you say nothing. And although you don't know it yet, this may become a pattern. It will get easier with practice, but will always be difficult to talk with your partner about your residency in Holland. Your emotions will often line up. You'll be accepting things and trying to build a home just as he starts clamoring for appointments with more diplomats to be able to fix it all. And then you'll switch, you'll move into anger and him into acceptance. And you'll be afraid to share in your depression because it might be contagious. How can you share all of the things you hate about Holland without worrying that you're just showing your partner all of the reasons that he should sink into depression too? And what you keep thinking 
but can't bring yourself to say aloud is that you would give anything to go back in time a few months. You wish you had never bought the tickets. It seems no traveler is ever supposed to say, I wish I never got to this place. I just want to be back home. But it's true, and it makes you feel terrible about yourself, and it's just fantastic. A giant dose of guilt is what a lonely, terrified, lost tourist needs. And although don't, you don't know it yet, this is the part that will fade. After you're ready and you get out of the airport, you will get to know Holland and you won't regret the facts that you've traveled. Oh, you will long for the little Italy from time to time and you'll want to rage against the unfairness from time to time. But you will get past the little voice that once said, take this back for me, I don't want this trip at all. Each traveler has to find their own way out of the airport. Some people navigate through the corridors in a pretty direct path. The corridors can lead right in a row denial, to anger, to bargaining, to depression, to acceptance. More commonly, you shuffle and wind around. You leave depre the depression hallway to find yourself somehow back in anger again. You may be here for months, but you will leave the airport, you will. And as you learn more about Holland, you will see how much it has to offer and you will grow to love it. And it will change who you are for the better. So for our families, and especially the families I've supported for two decades, um, none of them were adoptive families. They all gave birth to their child with a disability. And none of them went into this with an incredible amount of awareness or choice. Their child with Down syndrome, their child with autism, their child with spina bifida, their child with cerebral palsy, their child with intellectual disabilities came with little knowledge. Some with a little bit of prenatal um, awareness, some not. And it was hard. And what they say to me is, there are hard days, and there are easy days, and there are hard stages, and there are easy stages. Um, they're eventually able to work through some of, some of the acceptance issues, but don't ever sit back and think that it's ever completely easy. So when everybody else's child was going to the typical kindergarten, and their child wasn't, it was hard. When other people's children were going to their high school prom and their child wasn't, it was hard. So that circling around is a very real part of their life, not a part of their life they want to let go of, they accept, they embrace, but don't ever for one moment think when they move through one stage, it's because it's easy. And so it reminds me a lot to step into a family's home with humility. I'm not the expert. I don't have all the answers. They're the expert in their child. But I'm there to humbly learn about what they need in order to get a break so that they can continue to do what they do when I go home at the end of the night. Any thoughts about that? What I want you to do now is turn to the next piece on page 11, which is Welcome to My Home, I Think. And you're going to read what a parent's experience is when people come in to help her, help her child. And what I want you to do is read this one to yourself, but I want you to jot in the margins some of the different feelings, emotions, sensations that you see this family caregiving and giver experiencing. We rarely see families at the Amsterdam International stage, right? That's when they're sort of first getting the diagnosis, they're first experiencing. We typically come into families a little bit more in the welcome to my home stage. So what I want you to do is take about three minutes, and I want you to read this, and I want you to jot in the margins some of the things that you see this family caregiver experience, and then we're going to share them together. So just take a few moments. If you need a pen, um, we have plenty of pens and pencils and things over there. Just raise your hand, we can bring one to you. But otherwise, just take a few moments. And as you finish up, just go through, maybe write in the margins, some of the different emotions or reactions that you see this family caregiver experiencing. So, welcome to my home, I think. What did we see this family caregiver experiencing in terms of emotions? And you can just shout some of them out. Frustration, desperation, 
Uncertainty. Uh, shame, judgment. Shame and judgment. What else? Say that again. Threatened. Threatened. Thank you. Tiredness. Tiredness. Arrogance. What was that last one? Arrogance. Arrogance. Jealousy. Insecurity. Insecurity, and I missed one. Jealousy. Jealousy. Exhausted. Exhausted. Overwhelmed. And did I hear one more? Oh. Weakness. Frustration. Frustration. Okay. Inadequacy. Inadequacy. Acceptance. Acceptance. Do you have exhaustion? <laughs> exhaustion. Yes, exhaustion. Hope. Hope. Let's recap some of these. As a family caregiver, this story is pretty typical of family caregivers. To experience some feeling inadequacy, frustration, desperation, uncertainty, shame, judgment, jealousy, overwhelmed, hopeful, defensiveness, threatened, acceptance of your situation, tiredness, weakness, arrogance, insecurity, and exhausted. How do you get up every day? Left out. Left out? When you look at that list, do you wonder how family caregivers do it every day? every day to be faced with those feelings. This day was no different in her life than any other day. Something else is though on that list is missing. And what do you think it is? Depressed. Oh, she's probably depressed. Strength. Strength? Did somebody say it or strength? Love. Love. Does anybody doubt that she doesn't love her child? But when we see, when we come in as that worker, and I'm not necessarily talking about a respite worker, but the professional that comes in, here's what we see. We see that person who's experiencing frustration and desperation and tiredness and weakness and insecurity and jealousy and judgment and being left out. And we forget at the end of the day that we go home. And this person loves their family member. But that love gets pushed way down. You know, when there were times when my sister and I shared the caregiving of my mom, and she and I would fight, my sister and I. We didn't fight because we didn't care about each other. We fought because we loved our mother so much. And sometimes we just needed to get the frustration, the insecurity, the exhaustion out. But to an outsider, they probably thought, look at those two crazy Italian girls. Their hands are flying, the words are flying, spit is flying. And it wasn't because we didn't care about each other. It's because we loved our mother so much. 
But I have to tell you that when you meet your families that you'll be providing respite care, they're going to be experiencing all of these other things. But what you have to see is this. People don't typically make bad decisions intentionally. People typically don't want to not care for their family member, but they're tired, they're exhausted, they're working, they're trying to do what is right by their family, what is right by their heart, and what is right by their culture. And don't ever not see the love. And I would hope that after the end of today, that when you think about those family members, love doesn't come up 20th on the list. It comes up maybe in the top three. It's important. So now I want you to turn to Vivian's letter on page 13. And you'll notice there's some, some sunshines. And I'm going to let you guys read it. I'm going to hand the microphone. And as soon as you get to a sunshine, it's your opportunity to hand the microphone to someone else. Um, so we're going to start. And I'm going to start with students because they're used to doing things like this. Right here. Yeah. Oh, there's something he wants to, I love that, he wants to read. So read until the sun shines, and then hand it off to anybody else in the room. Go ahead. Vivian's letter. Hi. Just wanted to let you know how Mom is doing, and say Happy Mother's Day. Many of you have told me this would not be easy, and boy, you are so right. I look at Mom with such sadness and pity and wish I could do more for her to make her pain go away. Think of mom when you say you can't find anything to wear. It is sad for someone who had enough clothes to wear for the next 10 years and never wear the same thing twice. Now she is not able to dress herself. She was putting them on backwards or inside out. I was wondering why she didn't want to get out of her PJs, but watched her one morning. She didn't know what to do with the clothes she had in her hands. She wants to wear the same thing over and over again because it is less painful to pick up something else. Now I dress her and make her look pretty. The next time you dress yourself and find something to wear, just be glad you know what to do and what and to do with it and where it goes. Think of mom the next time you take a nice warm bath and are enjoying it. Appreciate the fact that you're not afraid of the water, that it feels so good to get nice and clean, and that you can get out of the tub on your own in privacy, and that you can bathe alone. The only time I enjoyed taking a shower with someone was when it was in a passionate moment and, cl and cleanse cleanliness was not the only thing on my mind. My girlfriend, Gianni, has helped me gather a lot of her clothes to donate to the people in need and to a church. We have filled 30 trash bags and still has more. I cried the first time I did it, but it gets easier. Easier now knowing that someone can, can use them. I cried too, because I can't fit in any of her things. She is so tiny and I am so big. The next time you go into a room and forget why you went there, Think of mom. She does it all the time. Now, the only problem is that when we retrace our steps, we usually remember why she doesn't. She had more shoes than Imelda Marcus and can't wear them anymore because she can't walk without losing her balance. She sometimes sneaks in her room and puts on a pair of heels and just stands there, afraid to move. She has fallen a couple of times but luckily, she has not hurt herself. I don't know anyone that has feet small enough to wear them. If you know of someone, let me know. Think of mom the next time you put on your favorite pair of shoes and really enjoy how good they make you feel. She is going blind in one eye, and a doctor is constantly testing her to see if she will need surgery for glaucoma. She comes for a new pair of glasses, but the ones she has are brand new. I look at her eyes and they are so sad. She tries to cry, but her tear ducts are dry, and so no tears will come. I cry for her and I have enough for the both of us, but she never sees me cry. 
Think of mom the next time you're at a dance and see a senior lady sitting and waiting to be asked. She is probably remembering when she was young like you and burned up on the floor at a bathroom somewhere, listen, listening to a great big band entering a jitterbug contest, a marathon in her best dress that she can no longer fit into or is in the back in her closet of memories. Ask her to dance and give her a thrill again. It only takes the length of a song to make her happy. Mom used to go to Old Sweet Ballroom in Oakland, Caliph, and that is where she met my dad. Mom asked me every day if she can help me do something. I wish she could. She wants to wash the dishes, but she doesn't know what the soap is for. If you come to my house and you happen to see a dirty dish or glass in the cupboard, just take it out quietly and put it in the dishwasher for, for me, for I miss that one. Think of mom when you want to go for a walk and then put it off because of one excuse or another. She never drove a car and loved to walk. She used to walk all over Hayward instead of taking the bus. She never asked anyone for a ride. Now she can't walk anywhere without the aid of a walker or holding on to a wall. Think of mom when you remember the good times you had with your friends and family and can still be a, oh sorry, laugh at funny things you did with them. And you can still remember who they are. Even the bad can be a blessing if you remember it. Enjoy the next book or magazine you read and can remember it a day or two from now, how much you like it and how it enriched your life. Mom loves magazines that she gets and reads the same ones over and over again. She enjoys them every time she reads them because to her, they are new stories. She'll pick the same book 10 minutes from now and will read the same thing again. It does save money. I'll hide, I just hide them and then in a week change them again. I quit telling her or talking about the people that have died in the family because she goes through the loss each time. She still wants to visit her sister who has passed. She wants to visit her friend that died many years ago in Pennsylvania too. Enjoy your home and be thankful that you don't have me taking care of me. She keeps asking to go home because she has visited us too long, and her dog must be missing her. Your heart is where your home is, and I have broken her heart. I hug her a lot, especially when I lose my cool and get angry because I think she doesn't want to behave. It is sad how our roles are reversed. Funny, I always wanted a child, and now I have one. And a defiant one at that, I still can't tell when she is mom or when ALZ takes over. Please don't feel sorry for mom or me. This is a choice she made, not talking to me about what to do if and when this was going to happen or preparing for her care. What would make me happy is to tell you not to put your children through this. If at all possible, prepare yourself for what time comes. If you are fortunate enough and foolish, foolishly want to live forever, but your mind and body doesn't want to do the same. Write memories down or tell your children's stories about yourself or your family before you get too old and don't remember the stories correctly. Even if your children aren't interested now, maybe your grandchildren will want to know. Everyone has a story and yours is unique. Mom talks to people now and tells stories about herself. I get confused about whom she is talking about. Mom still knows who I am, but I know that soon she won't recognize me. Some moms make bad choices, but who hasn't? We live with the choices that we make. Who is to say what a good mom is? It is up to the individual. If you are lucky enough to be a mom or a dad, be the best you can be. Maybe you are. Only your children know. If you still have the chance and think you need to do better, do it before it's too late. You don't get another life to make it right. If you have a mom and she is healthy, 
be thankful if she can take care of herself. If she is ill or in a rest or unwells at home, don't pass out the opportunity to visit and love with her. There might come a time when you will no longer have the chance. Hug her real tight and tell her how much you love her. If you lost your mom too soon, I'm sorry. I just hope you had a chance to enjoy her when she was here. I hope you miss her as much as I miss mine. Powerful piece that the act of care is an act that takes us from birth to death. The act of care relief can play a part at any time in our life. There is no greater or lesser value of providing respite to a family of a young child or an individual with an acquired disability who is growing in their disability or someone who is aging. That need is very real no matter where we are in our lifespan or our disability. It just may impact the family differently. The sense of loss we feel may feel different or look different. The sense of joy that we feel may look different or feel different. For parents of young children um, with disabilities, the joy may come from having their, their child experience things that other children in the community are experiencing. For me, caring for my mom when she was at the final stages of her life and with her aging and memory issues, the joy came from just seeing her be able to dress herself before I got to the house and knowing that um, she did it and felt a sense of completion. I was telling a story yesterday. I, I, it's sort of a joke, but it's true. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm raising a teenage daughter and was caring for my mom, and I really wanted my teenage daughter to be a part of the caregiving re experience. One, I wanted her to have that opportunity to hear those stories from her grandmother and to enjoy her grandmother. The other thing is I'm hoping that when I get old, one of my kids is going to take care of me. Um, so I keep looking around me, which one of you is going to be? Um, so, but, but my teenage daughter needs support too. You know, she's sort of at that point in her life where she needs some guidance and some direction, but some autonomy and independence. And one day I was just very tired, and I'm tired of sometimes always having to remind my mom to do those things over and over and over again, or hear those stories over and over and over again. And tired to have to come home and remind my family to do things over and over and over again. So I said, Sophia, you know, um, don't forget to put on a bra and put on some deodorant. And then I just immediately caught myself and I said, you know, one day, honey, you're going to be older and mommy's not going to have to remind you of things anymore and I'll be sad because you'll be grown up. And she looked at me and she goes, it's okay, mom, then you'll be like me, mom. And I'll have to remind you to put on a bra and wear deodorant too. So I thought, you know, there is a benefit to that full circle. You don't often get the chances to laugh in your caregiving, but you should get the chances to laugh in your caregiving. So, what I want to do now is I want each table to pick one representative. This is sort of the Hunger Games part of the morning. Um, you're going to pick somebody um, to be tribute. Again, it's not going to be that bad. I want you to pick one person from each table to come up here. And you don't have to do anything that's really crazy. I just need one person from each table to help me do something. So we'll give you a moment to do that. And each time I add in an experience, I'm going to give a balloon. And your job, if I give you the balloon, is to pass it to the person next to you as quickly as you can because more balloons are going to be coming. Okay? And we're going to just watch what families need to juggle on a given day, on a given part of their life, on a given sort of element. So we're going to just start out with you're a family member and you're caring for somebody who has needs that exceed the typical population. There's somebody with a disability or is aging and as you're providing care, you find out that all of a sudden your car breaks down and now you can't get around as easy as you want to. And as a result of your car breaking down, you've been late for work and you've been reprimanded by your boss. So you're feeling a little stressed because your boss is not as understanding as you want him to be. And while you're at work, you get a call 
that one of your other children is sick and you have to leave and go pick them up. And while you're managing that sick kid who's just experiencing some typical vomiting bug that makes all of us happy, um, you find out that the doctor who's been caring for your family member with special needs is moving off of the island and you've got to find another care provider. And while you're trying to go through the list to see if there's another care provider that can provide for your family member, the school call and there's some issues that you need to go and attend to and they would prefer if you do it sooner than later. And while you're thinking about that and managing, your boss, who up to this point was pretty welcoming and accepting, is no longer accepting and recommends that you take some time away from work to sort of get your act together. He didn't quite use those words. He was a little bit more colorful. So now you're struggling with finding a new doctor, a sick kid, a car that's not working very well, and it seems like they're having some trouble over here, not 100% sure. Um, but your landlord calls, and he just wants to remind you that the rent is due. And now you're faced with something really difficult, which is you need some groceries and medication, and we can't let any balls fall to the ground, people. You've got to juggle your life responsibilities. You've got groceries and medication that need covered, and you need to pay your rent. And guess what? You've got other family members and other kids, and they're like, Mom, Dad, what about our needs? And how come somebody's holding more balls than others over here? But then all of a sudden there's some good news and that's you found another job. So your boss who sort of told you to take it and keep moving people, keep moving, life's responsibilities don't wait. So your new, your, your new boss has said you've got the job but you can't take it because it's a night shift and you have no one to take care of your family member. And your spouse is now getting to the point where they say, I can't take it anymore. We've got to make some strong decisions. And you thought to yourself, I thought we were always in this together. We're a husband and wife. What's going on? And then your oldest daughter says, Mom, Dad, I got accepted to college. The college is in California. And you really need your oldest daughter around to help provide care. Keep moving those balls, people. Look at how tight that circle is. Could it be any more frustrating? And you don't want your daughter to go because you can't, you can't lose your other caregiver. And then you look to figure something out and you look in and you realize you've lost your wallet. And you know that that's the start of when things start to happen for you. You get tired, you get stressed, you lose things, and you're just feeling all out of sorts. And you're feeling like you're sitting, no, nope, not in between the legs, people. Not in between the legs. We are not holding our life challenge. We are passing our challenges and moving our life experiences on. And you just know that it's, it's falling apart. You've lost your wallet. And all of a sudden, look how tight this circle is. Can it get any tighter? You're sick. And you can't go to the doctor because you don't want to know what's wrong. Because if you're sick and you're not there to take care of this, what's going to happen? Let's see how long they could go. Not long. <laughs> this is where respite steps in. Respite says stop. Put your balloon down. Take a breath and figure it out. The more that they got life's responsibilities, look at how tight that circle is. They couldn't even get any closer to each other if they tried. They were putting balloons under their arms, between their legs and places. I didn't even, I was worried about where some of those balloons were going to go. But it became hard. At first, did you see how optimistic they were? They were looking over their shoulder. I can take another stress hand it over. They, they couldn't get it fast enough. And then after a while, they weren't even looking at me anymore. I had to start throwing the stress into the circle. Thank you guys. You can have a seat. 
So what I want you to do just now for one short minute, and you can either take out a piece of scrap paper, or you can write it somewhere in your folder, you don't have to write it down if you have a better memory than me, and think about what is one thing that is weighing on your mind right now, right? Is it a bill that you forgot to pay before you left this morning, or a phone call that you forgot to make, or an email that you need to send, or a paper that is due and your teacher is sitting in the room and you're sort of thinking about it a lot? What is one thing you need to do? And just take a moment. So, who would be willing to just shout out and share what that one thing is that they forgot to do? Yep, in the back. Take a break. Take a break, okay? You forgot to take a break. What else do? Some cooking. Cooking something, okay? Cooking. Okay, wishing you could be with your dad. So, there are things that sort of clutter our mind. Sometimes we call them head trash, right? The things, they can be big things like, oh my gosh, like I need to go and see my mother-in-law. She lives in Florida in a nursing home. She is not long for this earth, and I keep putting it off because I'm doing other things, and I need to just sit down and make the arrangements to do that. And then there are more immediate things, right? I need to, during the next break, send out an email, or um, actually just even give myself a break, um, so I'm not hearing myself talk for a while. Things like that. Families, when you're there to provide respite, need that same guidance too. Sometimes your role when you first come to a family's home might be to help them think about what's something that you would like to accomplish today, right? Or what's something that you would like to do with your time? Because if you haven't been given the gift of time by someone else to, to do something, it's hard to use it well. How many times have you been on the internet and you're checking your emails and it reminds you of something that you needed to look up and all of a sudden you're researching it and then the next thing you know you're on Wikipedia and then somehow you're on Amazon ordering clothes or supplies, right? How, and you say to yourself, how did this happen? Like a minute ago, I was trying to work on this, and, then, and now I'm ordering something on Amazon. Prime shipping? Yes, please. You know, so how does that happen? What well, happens, because, and then the next thing you know, an hour goes by, right? Well, when you only have a few hours of respite care, and you spend your time sort of in that floating mind space, that at the end of your respite care, Sometimes you don't feel as good as you should. You feel more stressed. You're like, oh, you beat yourself up. I, I didn't get that, that thing done that I was going to do, or I didn't make plans to go and see my father, or I didn't get my laundry done, or I didn't get a shower. I can't tell you how many times when I was caring for my mom, it would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'd think, I didn't get dressed yet today, like, like really dressed. And then I would run my tongue over my teeth, and I'd think, I don't think I brushed my teeth. I love to brush my teeth. So if I'm forgetting, that's a really stressful time for me. And if I was at a point where a respite person came in and said to me, hey, Mary Jo, how do you want to spend your time today? I'd be like, I just want to get a really good shower and know that somebody's there with my mom in case she calls out for me. And if at the end of the time, I get distracted and do all sorts of other stuff and I don't get that shower, I might feel worse at the end of the respite, like, ah. Oh, not only did I not get a shower, but I wasted my rest of the time. So part of what you may be doing is helping families think about what they want to accomplish in that period of time, and then thinking with them, how can I help you accomplish that? Because some of our families are starving for conversation. You may ask yourself at the end, am I, re am I providing respite care to their, their family member or to them? Because they just wanted me to hang out and talk. And the answer to that is a little bit of both. But your job then is to sort of move them when appropriate onto the thing that they want to get done. Right? So it's helping them think about how they want to use their time, what they want to accomplish today, and helping them think about that. You know, sometimes I just want to watch Netflix, quite frankly. I just want to binge watch something and be mindless and enjoy somebody else's experience. And if I'm not watching that, I'm watching The Real Housewives, 
And my husband will say, why do you want to watch those terrible women? And I'll say to him, because then I feel good. I feel like I'm nice. You know, I'm not tossing tables. I'm not talking down my girlfriends. I'm just a nice girl. So, you know, it's up to me to think about, am I doing laundry or grocery shopping or trash TV? But I need that. I need that control, and I need that guidance towards meaningful use of time. So just some things to think about, right, when you're with your care family. So I want to switch gears a little bit now and just have you turn to page 17. And we're not going to get deep in the weeds with this. This is not uh, a lesson on child development or Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I just want you to think for a moment, depending on the life stage, where families might be experiencing some of their joy and some of their challenge and some of their grief. And it might be, and stress is, and I say that, joy and grief, when talking about stress, because stress can be good stress, stress can be bad stress. I had good stress getting ready to get on a plane to get here and knowing that it was gonna take me a couple of days to do that. I had good stress planning my wedding, but it was stress. So stress comes in all sorts of forms. Um, when families have young children with disabilities, the stress can be sometimes not even knowing what the diagnosis is, or when your kids start to do things in public that other kids aren't doing and people don't really get it, so they're, they're making faces or worse yet, they're saying things. When they get older, it might be the lack of options, right, or not getting that teacher who really gets your kid. Or it could be the drain of resources. It's when the juggling sometimes really starts to hit. It's the lack of respite care. And I, I don't often throw around the word babysitting with it because when you look at somebody who's feeling frustrated and with desperation and uncertainty and shame and judgment, I probably wouldn't put a 13-year-old babysitter in that environment to also care for somebody who has some support needs. So that's why we think of respite, especially within this context, as being someone who's 18 or over. Um, as somebody gets older, there's issues related to sexuality. Sexuality of individuals with intellectual disabilities who may have an intellectual impairment, but their body is still functioning at a chronological level. Or even sexuality in, in aging populations. So for those of you who work with individuals or have supported someone who's aging, you know that there's a whole sexuality thing that happens near the end of life that's sort of like raising a group of teenagers again. I had three teenage boys at one time. It was a hot house, I'm gonna tell you. My mother, when my father passed away, we thought she was going to grow into a state of just despair, despondency, and depression. And it was about a year later, and she was sort of coming alive again. And she blew out the candles on her birthday cake. And my boys said, Grandma, what did you wish for for your birthday? And she said, a sugar daddy who's good in bed and has a house on the beach. <laughs> and the kids were like, Grandma, no. They felt scarred, right? Grandma, no. But you know that at different life stages, your family member who has a disability or is aging might just do some things that might not be typical of other people, right? And then there's the increasing need for support to get things done, and that need for support is not gonna go away, right? My mom was not gonna get up one day and be able to shower herself completely independently. I could make life easier, I could get her a walk-in shower, I could do things like that, but she was not gonna be independent. And then the fear of death. And for families of children with certain disabilities, that fear is what happens if I die and there's no one to care for that person. And for me as the caregiver of an aging person, it's, it's the only way this is gonna change is when my mom dies. So it's helpful to think about this when you enter into a family's home. Families know that their family member is engaging with their environment differently. If you're the parent of a child with a disability and your child's not meeting developmental milestones, having a respite worker come in and say, oh my gosh, my sister sat up when she was six months of age. I can't believe your child's not sitting up yet. They know that their kid is not sitting up. I can guarantee you that, right? So your work to come into respite is not to provide intervention and therapy and diagnosis. It's there to provide caregiver relief. 
And the same way of uh, coming in with somebody who's aging is to say, gosh, you know, that is, you know, that, that's a disease with no cure. Alzheimer's, they're just going to die. Well, family members know that too. So I want you to be mindful of the developmental stage of when you're walking into a family. But I also want you to know that you're walking in with humility and you're walking in with grace. And you're leaving that family with a sense of compassion. You're not there to diagnose. You're not there to reinforce. They know these things. And there are times when families may ask you for advice, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and you really have to take a pause and ask yourself, is this something that you should be advising? Because there are times when you should not be advising. You're just there to provide care. So. We're going to sort of pause on that, check in with you, and see if there's any questions. And I'm going to get you up and moving a little bit. We're going to, um, I, earlier I mentioned that you cannot, I, my expectation is that you not walk in the shoes of a caregiver or a care recipient. Um, we would never know what it is like to be disabled unless we have that disability ourselves. And unless you're a caregiver, it's really hard to know what it's like to experience the caregiving, but you can experience walking with people. So what I want you to do is we're going to um, have some opportunities to sort of experience what it's like to be frustrated, to what it's like to not be able to do everything exactly the way that we want to do it or what it's like to have to communicate in ways that are not really typical, right? But still get our message understood. I have um, a very good friend in the disability field who says, behavior is communication. So that person may not be verbal, that person may not be vocal, that person may not speak the language that you speak, or indicate things in ways that you understand, but behavior is communication. So when I and my mom desperately wanted a pet, and there was just not a way we could incorporate a pet into her household, but our neighbor was willing to get a kitten and train it every day to come over to her house. So they let the cat out in the morning, he would immediately scamper to her house, the caregiver or myself would let the cat in, the cat would spend the day with her and then go home at night. When my mom would pet and cuddle with that cat, it's when I knew that she was saying she felt loved and could love. But my mother would never tell you that. My mother was not the I love you kind of person, like, oh my god, there's my daughter, I love her so much. She'd be like, you're late. But then she would pet the cat, and I'd be like, okay, there's love, right? There's love. Behavior is communication. So sometimes we have to think about why are people behaving the way that they do and what are they trying to communicate to us. It's not always obvious, right? When you hear that screech of the microphone and you just want to cover your ears, people with sensory integration issues experience that all the time. Were these bright lights shining on me? If I was somebody with sensory integration, this would drive me crazy. Or the fan that's blowing behind me. All of that would make it really challenging for me to be able to communicate with you today. So, you know, I might behave in a way that's really unusual, and you might say to yourself, as you got to know me better, well, Mary Jo needs the microphone turned down, or the lights turned down, or the fan turned off, in order to be successful. So what we're thinking about in doing some of these activities that we're going to do right now is not, again, to put yourself in the shoes of a person with a disability, but thinking about what would help be successful. So what I want you to do is, when I ask you to, you're all going to stand up, and you are not going to use words. You're not out of your mouth. You're not going to vocalize any word out of your mouth. <coughs> And we are going to line up, let's see, where can we do this? From that door to this wall, that door to this wall, in order of our birth date, not our year, but our, our month and day of birth, from January to December, every single person in this room and we are going to communicate but by not 
verbally, vocally saying, my birthday is June 1st, right? So, when I ask you to, I'm gonna say, stand up and go, and January 1 is gonna be there, and then a line is gonna continue all the way across the stage, and December 31st is gonna be there. January 1, lining all of you up, and by the end, we should have a nice line that goes in order. Ready, go. And as I'm doing it, 
you're going to move in the direction that the arrow says. So if it says up, you're going to take a step up. Left, you're going to go to your left. Up, up, down, left, right, and all the way through. So it's important you sort of get yourself to a point where either you can see the arrows or you trust your neighbor implicitly to direct you in the right way. So what you're going to do is see what it is and say what it is. And a lot of you are college students, so I have high expectations of you to see it, say it, do it. All right? Starting on the count of three. One, two, three. Up, left, up, 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 down, left, right, down, down, left, up, left, up, right, up, down, 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 right, up, right, When I say left, I'm moving right. You're going to say what it is, but do the opposite. Say what it is, but do the opposite on the count of three. One, two, three. Up. Tells you something to do, 
Um, it could be a sock with puzzle pieces. And each of the tables, there's probably a total of four or five different activities. You're going to sort of take some time and move around to the different tables. Um, with the um, ones that look like this, there's two pictures where you spot the differences. Um, and I know that's something we all did as kids. One is in black and white, and one is in color. And I, all I want you to do is look and see how much more difficult it is to do when you can't see the colors, um, especially for somebody who might have a visual processing issue. Uh, and on some of the other tables, you're going to see instructions that tell you to say the word but read the color or vice versa. There's some other exercises to do. With a, there's two tables that have puzzles and a sock, and what you're going to do is put your hand in the non, your non-dominant hand in the sock, and you're going to build, try to build the puzzle. So each table has something on it, but in total, there's probably five or six different activities going around. And I just want you to do a couple of things. Move around to the tables to try some of the different activities. And then as you do that and you're feeling ready, um, I think we can do lunch at 11.30. Is that still correct? So it's about 11.24. I just want you to take a few minutes, move around from table to table. Some of the activities may make you feel silly and uncoordinated, and others may make you feel incredibly capable. We don't know. Um, so take some time, and then at, once you complete trying the different activities, Go ahead in and get your lunch and bring it back to your table and we'll keep going. Thanks. So we're, we're going to multitask a little bit, and that'll allow everybody the opportunity to finish their lunch in a relaxing way, um, but still be respectful of your time. Um, the next thing I want to talk with you about is you had a wonderful opportunity this morning to really think about what respite is, what the impact of caring for a family member uh, with a, a special need or disabling condition can do and how that can feel. Um, you have the opportunity to sort of put yourself in the uh, experience of not being able to do everything as you might have wanted to, using alternative ways of communicating or uh, feeling a little frustrated. So you might have the chance now to think about what is what it is like for the people that we support, right? That if we gave people a little bit more time for activities, or explain them a little bit differently. And now what I want you to move into and think about is person-first language, and that's page 19 in your manual. But what person-first language really is about is thinking about the person first and seeing the person first and seeing their disability or special need as a component of who they are, but not wholly who they are. So as an example, <coughs> You know, um, sometimes we talk about people who are confined to wheelchairs. Well, confined really is not an appropriate person first perspective. The wheelchair is just how they get, happen to get around. That's their legs, right? It'd be like saying, somebody saying to me, Mary Jo is confined to her short legs because I'm barely five foot tall. It's just who I am. So what person first language does is it really encourages you to think about the person and think about them in a way that is compassionate but not pitiful, to think about the person in a way that values who they are um, and doesn't devalue them because of their disability. For those of you who are going to end up working in healthcare, um, a lot of times we will hear a phrase used when somebody is on uh, a ventilator and perhaps in a coma, and they'll say, you know, they're in a persistent vegetative state. 
And we start to see that person then as what? Not a person, but a vegetable. A vegetative state does not inspire a level of living, a level of humanness. When we start to, to refer to people as subhuman, we all of a sudden start to not see them as people. Right? When we start to see people as autistics or uh, people who are um, you know, nonverbals, then we start to not see them as people. So person first is a constant and consistent respectful reminder that what we are doing is supporting people and people who have needs. Now they may have that need. Person first language doesn't like tear the paper in half and deny that the disability exists by throwing it away. Person first language says it's a piece of who they are, but it is not solely who they are. So some of you may walk out of this room today and say, I don't know if I can volunteer. You know, I don't know if I have the time. I don't know what my future may hold or your life may change tonight, tomorrow, or a month from now. What I want you to carry with you is the value of the person first language. If you can do no more in your daily life than see people as people first and respect them for who they are, you still are doing a wonderful, wonderful thing. So on page 21 in your manual, it actually gives you some examples of person first language. That we prefer the, the label say um, people with disabilities instead of the handicapped or the disabled, the handicapped what, right? It's a person with a disability. And I don't know if you are aware of the history of where handicap came from. The word handicap came from um, olden times when people with disabilities were not working and they had to beg. And it literally meant cap in hand. They were the people that were on the street corner with their cap in hand begging for money and people would come and drop coins or whatever into that cap. And because most of the people that were begging were people who had disabilities, we began to refer to those people as handicapped. Um, rather than saying, you know, somebody is, is autistic or learning disabled, you can say she is diagnosed with or she's been identified with. Um, instead of saying a client, it's somebody who's a customer, uh, somebody who's brain damaged, Brain injury. I know those seem like subtle differences, but subtle differences mean so much. So much when you're looking at really supporting people. So again, person first language. And Kathy Snow is the person who is reflected on all of your um, resources in your binder. She's got a wonderful website called Disability is Natural. And I highly encourage you to get on that website and look at some of that information written from the perspective of individuals with disabilities and parents of children with disabilities who are really looking at promoting what we all want. We all want the good life, right? We all want good things in life. We all want valued social roles. And valued social roles come in life from people seeing us as having worth, having social capital. So person first language is the first step to socially valued roles and having social capital. Um, you know, there are labels that we can give ourselves and there are good labels and bad labels, right? We can see bad labels all the time, but there are good labels like student. Student is a good label. Volunteer, community member. Those are things that inspire positivity and social capital. What we want to do is support our, our family members who are caring for our individuals with support needs to have that same level of social capital for their entire family. So um, just, just a few thoughts on that for you. We're going to move on, and this is a little bit of the rubber hits the road. So I'll need you to um, pay attention and participate where you're able. Um, we are going to go through the volunteer rights and responsibilities, and you're going to sign some paperwork for me at this point, and you're going to uh, keep it all together because you're going to turn it in at the end. And we're going to start with volunteer rights. And rights, as you remember, are the things that you can do as a volunteer, not the things that you're required to do, the can-dos. And we're just going to walk through them. 
They're true or false. We're going to do them together. And I'll just have you shout out the answer when we get to each one. Okay? So this is on page 23 of your manual. And it's volunteer rights. And the first one is, you have the right to match with a family which you would choose to be friendly with other, under other circumstances. True or false? True. True. Again, remember in the beginning when we were talking and introducing ourselves and finding some uniqueness and that commonality with each other? I want you to think about your volunteer opportunity as a way to connect with somebody that you might have met somewhere else in your life had it not been through the volunteerism and really enjoyed your time with them. Number two, you have the right to be treated with courtesy and respect by your respite care family and staff. True, absolutely. You have the right to be provided needed, you have the right to provide needed advice on parenting to your respite care family. False. Stay away from that, right? Um, I say that family caregivers, whether they are parents or someone like me, somebody caring for a parent, they are the experts in their family's care. Your role in there is to provide caregiver relief. There are times when you might do things differently, which is fine um, to a degree, but you want to honor that family's family rules and home rules and culture and customs, um, but you're not there to add, to provide therapy. You're there to provide a caregiver break. Number four, you have the right to receive quality training to prepare you for your volunteer assignment. True, and it starts today, but it doesn't end today. Some of you, many of you, have no idea where you're going to be volunteering or what type of role you might have. So this is a step in the whole training process, but it doesn't end here. You have the right to an assignment in which you would be fulfilling a real need. True. And I'm going to tell you, though, um, just sort of a step back of honesty on that. All family caregivers have some level of need for a break. And I think that you can be reasonably certain whether you have come here to support children with disabilities, um, individuals with acquired disabilities, individuals who are aging, that you will be fulfilling a real need. Some people just can't ask for help as easily as others. Some people cannot accept help as easily as others. But at the end of the day, I can assure you that you're doing something that is very beneficial and hopefully gratifying to you as well. Um, you have the right to a letter of recommendation after the determined amount, sometimes it's usually three months, of satisfactory service. And that's true. If you're a student and you're volunteering, um, if you're a community member, after about three months, you should be able to get some documentation that you can provide to someone if need be about your volunteer experience. When everybody leaves today, they're going to get a certificate that documents that they had four hours of volunteer service training. So we acknowledge that you're giving your gift of time and there's some small things that we can do to demonstrate our appreciation in return. You have, and this is number seven, the right to regular and consistent contact with respite care staff. True. Training you and matching you is barely half of the battle. We want you to be happy. We want you to be supported. We want you to feel both confident and competent in your respite care assignment. And that only happens if we keep in contact with you. Uh, you have the right to receive small gratuities for good service. Well, see, that's a little testy, right? Okay. You're a volunteer because you're not getting paid. You may be getting college credit. There may be stipends or something down the road to assist you in your volunteerism. But you're volunteering to give your gift of time. But that doesn't mean the family can't show appreciation to you. It may be a thank you card. It might be your birthday and they want, might want to make something small for you. That's fine. So that's one of those, you know, you're not getting paid on a daily, hourly basis. And there may be a time, and that's something that Jack and everybody will keep you informed with down the road, that there might be vouchers available for families to purchase care. And obviously, those who have been trained would be ideal people to be candidates for that. Um, but at this point, we're really looking at the volunteer piece. You have the right to have your family's guidelines, concerns, and needs clearly spelled out. And that's true. Absolutely true. Um, if you came to my house 
to watch someone in my home, physically in my home, I've got some family guidelines or rules. And one is, um, I always keep my doors unlocked because I can't even find my house key. So if you lock the door, there's a chance you've just locked me out. Um, but we always take our shoes off when we come into our home. We don't wear shoes in the home. Um, we have three cats. They don't go outside, even though they think that they might want to go outside. They don't. So if you were in my home, there's things you would need to know, right? Don't lock the door. Take your shoes off. Don't let the cat go. If you go to my mom's home, um, she has all um, tile floor. It's very, very cold. You would never want to take your shoes off there because your feet would get really cold. So you wear shoes all the time there. Um, my mom lives in a different community than I do. All the doors are locked all the time, even when we're in the home. You know, little things like that. So there, you have a right to have those guidelines clearly spelled out for you. So number 10, you have the right to buy gifts for your assigned individual or family. Again, it's sort of slippery slope, right? Because your gift is your gift of time. That's your present. If you buy gifts for someone all the time, think about that little oh, preschooler. And every time you go over, you take Play-Doh or Jacks or some little game. All of a sudden, they're not as interested in you they're interested in what you're bringing. And so it's okay to bring something on a special occasion, like a birthday, if you wanted to bring some you know, silly putty or something like that. But really, what you're trying to do is to support the child to be successful in their own environment. And if you're really struggling with that, that's something to come back and talk to the respite program about, or your instructors about, and get some different ideas, or think about what are some things that you can do to engage that person. I became really good at finding low-cost, no-cost things to do with my mom. You know, because sometimes it wasn't the item that she wanted, it was the experience of getting out. She just wanted to be out and, and enjoying other people. You have the right to be covered for liability by respite care agent, the respite care agency's provided insurance, true or false? Very true. But here's the catch on that. If you look in your back um, right pocket, you're going to see the incident procedure. And it's going to discuss some things that might warrant um, a liability issue. And that would be like an injury. You know, you, you get injured in lifting someone or doing something in respite care. You have to call for emergency support. Um, there's a theft. Maybe you left your car unlocked and somebody took something out of it. Um, unwanted advances, and I don't mean necessarily sexual advances. It could be somebody encouraging you to purchase something that you don't want to purchase, um, any abuse, or anything that's not consistent with respite care. So those kinds of things would be covered, and we would want you to follow the procedure, which is clearly outlined in here, and then fill out an incident report. And our feeling is, if we give you the incident report, you'll never need it. 20 years of running a respite program, I had one incident report. And it was not based because um, of something the volunteer or the family did wrong. The child had experienced a severe life-threatening seizure, and an ambulance had to be called. So when the volunteer showed up to do her respite, the ambulance was there. They were providing some um, extreme life-saving measures, and she was not able to provide the respite. And she wanted to inform me that something drastic was happening. If you have incident procedures in place, you're going to know what to do if something happens. Um, but you have to sort of check yourself at this point and say to yourself, am I acting as a responsible volunteer? And I'm going to give you an example. You are with your respite, uh, you're providing service to a child, and you're providing the respite, and you decide to go over to the playground, and you're swinging him on the swing, and he decides to jump off, right? Who remembers jumping off of a swing when they were little, right? He, he jumps off, he falls, and he breaks his wrist. That's an incident, right? You're not injured, but the child is. Are you covered by the agency's liability insurance in that situation if the family was to get angry? Yeah, you were right there. Accidents happen, right? Same situation. You're at the playground with the same child. You're swinging him on the swing, but your cell phone rings. And it's that person you've been looking to hook up with for quite some time. So you're going to take that call, right? Seeing that some of the people are nodding. They're like, yeah, I'm going to take that call. 
So you walk, you don't have good cell phone reception, so you're walking to the corner and a little bit farther, and you take the call, and it's a pretty good call. So you're on for like three minutes. That's a good, good little, you know. And you come back and you notice the child's fallen off the swing and broke their wrist. Are you covered? No. You left that child unsupervised. You were not acting within a good volunteer role. Your role when you are a respite worker is to give 100% of your time and energy to that person. To use your cell phone only when it's needed for the care of that person, either to ask the family a question, to call for help. It's not to maintain your personal life, your business life, or your life outside of that time that you're volunteering. If you're volunteering in a group environment, and you need to take that call, your responsibility is to get a floating staff or some other staff over or another volunteer to assist you before ever leaving that individual. So liability insurance and liability coverage is there for you, but only if you're acting within the roles and responsibilities of a good volunteer. So number 12, you have the right to provide additional care for the respite care individual and receive compensation. So let's say you're supposed to volunteer for two hours a week and that family says, gosh, we really want to go to a wedding and go to the reception, but that's like a longer day. Um, could we pay you to stay longer? Is that your right? Yeah. Let's face it. I, I didn't have a lot of people when I was raising four children who could come in and manage all of my kids and their support needs. So if I had somebody who said to me, if you need me to extend my time, I will do that, and you will, and, and I was willing to pay for it, that's fine. The only thing I never did as the person who ran the respite program is I didn't broker that deal. My babysitters would be the first to tell you that I was a horrible payer. I probably paid them far less than they were worth. It, that's, a, that's a decision between the family caregiver and the volunteer. My only responsibility is you volunteer first, right? You get your volunteer hours done, and then it is your choice if you choose to form a relationship with that family outside of the volunteer role where you might do additional service for them. And then finally, you have the right to request a change of assignment if any difficulties can't be resolved, true or false. True. We want you to be happy. I would love for you to get up and say, oh my gosh, today is my volunteer day. I cannot wait to get through work because at the end of my work day, I get to go and volunteer. I do not want you to get up and go, ugh, not today, Satan, not today. <laughs> right? I want you to feel good about your volunteer role. My favorite part of what I do with respite is what I'm doing right here today. And I've had a pretty long week. There have been like some long plane rides and we've had a lot of work leading up to this. And I walked in this morning and somebody said, how are you doing? And I said, great, because this is my favorite thing to do. This is my hands down. This is where I want to be. That's where I want you to be when you're volunteering with the person who's receiving your gift of time. If it's not feeling that way and you cannot resolve it, then I want you to think about how you can have a, a, an assignment that you can resolve. Make sense? Okay, so we are gonna switch gears now. We are gonna look at the responsibilities, and these are the things that you have to do. Okay, these are not flexible. Same thing, true or false. You have the responsibility to care for additional family members of your assigned individuals, true or false. False. Okay. You have the response. Now, is it your right? Family has twins. One has autism, one doesn't. Family says to you, you know, the kids really do better together. And in fact, the um, twin that does not have a diagnosis of autism sometimes can really help keep things going. You might say, you know what? He can stay around for a while. Then. That's your right. That is not your responsibility. Number two, you have the responsibility to perform minor medical procedures. False. I would define minor medical as Neosporin and a Band-Aid. If you're doing more than a um, Neosporin and a Band-Aid, then you shouldn't be doing it without some level of um, guidance or your parent input in that role at that point, even though you may be a nurse and far more qualified to do things. Um, 
I would say in the role of the volunteer, Neosporin and a Band-Aid is about as far as you should be taking it. You have the responsibility to follow your respite care family's guidelines and be sensitive to their needs. True. You have the responsibility to protect family confidentiality. True. So we want you to be excited. I would love you to go back, each of you who are students, to your classmates that are having, you know, going through other majors, and for those of you who are working out in the community, to all of your coworkers and say, I have the opportunity to volunteer for this most incredible program and make a difference in the lives of families. But I do not want you to go to their home and Snapchat a picture of you and the person you're caring for and say, I'm at Billy D's house and the front door is unlocked and I come every Thursday night and they have a cat but he's not dangerous. You know, and, and it sounds silly, but in the day of social media, how many people do we know that put on Facebook, hey, signing off for two weeks because I'm going on vacation. Nothing says rob my house more than people who tell you that they're signing off because they're not going to be around for a while. So in the same vein, we want to protect families' confidentiality and ensure that we're not disclosing first names, last names, photos, addresses, things like that. So if you're comfortable with that in concept, I want you to turn to your left-hand pocket, and you're going to see a confidentiality policy. I want you to take a moment, read, review. If you have questions, raise your hand. Regina, myself, Jack will be around to help you if you have any questions. So otherwise, it's pretty clear cut. And if you're comfortable, I want you to sign it and then stuff it back in that left hand pocket because we will be using it or filling it in and collecting it later. So read it, review it, sign it. If you can't sign it, raise your hand and let us know. or concerns over your relationship with that individual family. True or false? Mm, I hear some truths, I hear some false. The answer is actually true. If you're having an issue with someone, who better than to talk to than that person? So if you come to me as the respite coordinator of my program and say, I'm really struggling with Vic and his family and I don't know what to do, my first question would be, did you talk to Vic's family about this? See what the issue is? And I'll give you a really good example. Um, I had a young man with a lot of sensory and um, stimulation related issues as a part of his autism. So he always had, he was very percussive. Whenever he walked, he had to touch and tap like this all the time. Part of it was because he needed to know where he was in space, right? So he was always knocking and, and tapping. The other part was if he could get his hands down his pants, or into his genital area, he was always doing that. And as a result, there was a lot of hygiene issues. So, um, and a lot of times too, at the end of a school day that was very stressful for him, the idea of having confining clothes just, you know, uh, would wear him out, like the belt and the zipper and everything like that. So he would come home and his volunteer would come over after school and his volunteer was a school teacher. And in Pennsylvania, School teachers cannot touch students. It used to be that like a, an early childhood teacher could have a student sit on their lap and read a story. They're not allowed to touch students anymore. So this guy is a school teacher. He comes over to volunteer at the end of the day. This little boy comes home. He's tap, tap, tapping and ripping off all of his clothes, right? The belt comes off. And then he wants to sit on the lap of the teacher. And he, the teacher is just like, oh, no. 
right? It's been ingrained in him that that's not something to do. And he calls me and he goes, I don't know what to do. Vic just wants to keep sitting on my lap naked and I'm not comfortable with that and I don't know if this is going to work. What do I do? And I said, did you talk to his parents? He goes, you know, I didn't think of that. Um, and I said, I think you need to go back and talk to his parents and see. And their response was, that was a behavior that Vic did um, at times when things were really stressful at school. And what they learned is when he was experiencing stress at school and he would come home, they would immediately take him out of like the confining clothes with the belts and the zippers and they would put him in a wrestling singlet. And I don't know if you know what those are. They're like the long leotards for guys. Like they come down below the knee and it's one piece and it goes up over the shoulders. And he couldn't get his hands in everywhere and he was still dressed, right? So he had his underwear on and his wrestling singlet. And the volunteer was like, oh my god, that'll work. Okay, that feels, that's fine, that's fine. So something very simple. I didn't know about the wrestling singlet. I could have really just um, come up with all sorts of solutions that might not have worked, or maybe even worse yet, taken Pete out of the house and Vic wouldn't have had a respite volunteer and his parents wouldn't have gotten a break. But by circling back to the parents, who were the experts in their child, um, and if parents don't have the answers, they're at least willing to work with you. We were able to save that situation. So my recommendation always is, you know, speak with the family first, but then going down to number six, the next responsibility. If it's not working and you can't resolve it, you need to let me or, or whoever is directing that program know. It may be talking with Jack, it may be talking with a professor, maybe talking, you have to let someone know. And you do have that responsibility. So number seven, you have the responsibility to provide, re to provide respite care programs with their service hours on however they determine it. So it might be the end of the shift, the end of the month, the end of the semester, true or false? True. You've got to track your hours. Part of us Knowing if respite works is knowing how frequently um, families are receiving the care. And if you look in your back right pocket, there's actually an hours collection sheet. And once you are matched in your respite environment, they'll let you know how to turn in your hours. You may be emailing them. You may be smoke signaling them. You may be filling in that sheet. But you will be documenting them. And my recommendation is keep track of it. You're going to need it as a student. You're going to need it. Um, for the program if you're a community member, but you must keep track of your hours. And we're not asking, you know, so that we don't, we don't want to add another layer into the families of, of them always signing off on everything and doing things like that. We're really asking you as the respite volunteer to take, take the time to manage that piece. Number eight, this is a biggie. Not sure what the answer is. You have the responsibility to contact your respite care staff if two or more consecutive appointments are missed or canceled. True. Here's what I've experienced in two decades of running a program. If for some reason two appointments are missed unexpectedly, not that you're on break or taking a vacation, I'm talking about unexpectedly, your car breaks down, the family member is sick, you forgot to go, they're not home when you get there. Whatever the cause is, when you hit missing two consecutive visits, things really start to break down. Think of it as two broken dates with somebody you really have your eye on. You know that if you miss two dates in a row, something's going down and it's not good, right? So what happens is the family is saying, oh, Leah is so busy. If she had time, she'd call me and come over and volunteer, or she'd take my family member. On the flip side of that, Leah is sitting somewhere saying, oh, that family must have their act together. They must not really want me, because if they want me, they call. And it's like two people who just are sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, but nobody's picking it up and making the call. Two, I find that I can repair. If you've missed two consecutive visits, and you let the person who's coordinating your respite care know, it can be repaired. When it gets to three and four, I have to be honest, there are hurt feelings. Um, people, you know, students, people in the community, they're already feeling like they're trying to do good with their gift of time. They're feeling frustrated. Families, it's another loss. Remember this, welcome to my home? And some of the desperation she felt about people not showing up and not coming on in time, it's another loss. What we don't want to give, even with our best intentions, is another loss to families. So 
So number nine, you have the right or the responsibility, I'm sorry, to help solve intra-family problems and conflicts. I'll stay away from that, but you will often be asked. I'll tell you that right now. I had a family with a young adult child with Down syndrome. Their volunteer had been coming for seven years. The family was getting to a point where they were at a crossroads with what to do in relation to supporting their son. The father wanted to place their son in a facility with other individuals with Down syndrome where he could live and receive support. The mother wanted to continue to raise her son in an inclusive environment within the community and family. And the father said, this is taking a toll on us. If we don't place our son, I'm going to leave. And the mother said, if we place him, I'm going to leave. And on that day, Martha, their volunteer, came in completely unaware that this conversation was taking place. And each of them pulled Martha aside and said, what should we do? Should we place him? And then I leave. And then the husband said, should I keep him at home? And then I leave. And Martha had what I believe was the best answer of a volunteer I have ever experienced. Uh, their child's name was Danny. And she said, I can't tell you what to do but I will tell you that I'm here for Danny while you make the decision. Right? So she didn't weigh in on either side. And she may have been pro-community inclusion or she may have been pro-segregation. We don't know. Because all she said is, I can't tell you what to do, but you need to know that I'm here for Danny while you decide. Which reinforced that the role of the, the respite volunteer was not just about caregiver relief, but it's about being there for that person too. The family eventually resolved it, and Danny stayed home, and mom and dad continued to live together. It was a point of, of crisis in their life, similar to those readings that we read earlier this morning about where things circle back and circle back, and, and you keep experiencing that stress. If Martha had weighed in on one end or the other, and it doesn't even matter which end, her volunteer role would have ended shortly thereafter, because neither of the parents would have felt comfortable having her in the home knowing that she sided with one or the other. As a result, it has been 21 years. Danny is now 24 and Martha has been in his life for 21 years. That's an incredible difference. So number 10, you have the responsibility to extend your service hours if your family requests it. No. You, have, you will have volunteer guidelines set up by how, whatever entity you end up volunteering, whether it's through the university or the specific population, and that's the requirement, not if the family requests it. You have the responsibility to commit to the agreed upon number of hours of respite service for the requested time, so that's true. For some of you students, that may be a semester, right? Um, and if you want to continue afterwards, that may be something you consider, but you're at least committed for that semester. For community members, you may be just going to a faith-based respite opportunity once a month. Um, and the only expectation is that you show up that month or for the next three months. And then finally, you have the responsibility to report any, any occurrence of abuse or neglect. And that is true, and that's for everyone, not just nursing students, um, not just professionals. We are all responsible when we observe abuse or neglect, and there is information that you'll we'll go to um, in your binder that really talks about that. Um, and if you look at, um, yes, holler it out. Go ahead. Are you referring to number 10? Extend your service hours if you want to request it. Uh, I previously say if you can do your two hours of volunteer and then you they ask you for compensation, you do that. You don't have to get that back. No, because it's your right, not your responsibility. It is your right to extend your service hours. It is not your responsibility. I may choose. I may say to you today. I have time, I can stay longer. You may say, well, I'll pay you, I don't know, $9 an hour to stay longer, whatever. That's my right. But if I want to go, if I'm done volunteering and I choose to go home, I am not responsible for staying. That is not a requirement of my program, but it is a right of my program. Okay, we're good on that. 
All right, I'm gonna have you flip over to page 33. And we're gonna talk about, just briefly, um, promoting positive behavior. You know, respite should not be a punishment, right? It's not like, oh, I'm so tired of taking care of you, you're gonna go into respite. And on the other hand, respite shouldn't be denied to someone because of a behavior like, oh, if you're not good today, you don't get to go to respite. Respite really is that break. And when you're with that person, it's helpful if you promote positive behaviors, right? We want to, who feels better when people reflect on positive things about them versus negative, right? So by constantly pointing out the challenging things that that individual is doing is really not helping. Um, so if you do need to stop a behavior, you want to do it immediately and be situation specific. Um, giving rewards or, or positive feedback, being clear, immediate, not using phrases that could be negative to someone. Um, and also remembering that children with disabilities or people with cognitive impairments or aging people sometimes can't understand idioms or figurative speech very well. They're very literal. So I used to say um, to the one um, person I provided support to with an intellectual disability, I've got my eye on you. And I would find that person doing this a lot. And I was like, what are you doing? And they were like, what eye? Where is it? And I realized I use things like that all the time. Oh, let's hit the road, or I've got my eye on you. And for, for those of us who are comfortable with figurative speech, that seems very natural. But if you're somebody who can't process very well, that's very confusing. So, and again, you know, always doing things that are appropriate and consistent and immediate. Uh, especially if you tell your child that you're working with or a young adult with autism, next time when I'm here, we're not going to do this. You know, as a punishment, we're not going to do a puzzle. I can assure you that person's not going to remember that as a consequence the next time you're there. You either have to deal with the behavior then or let it go. And this is where I defer to the family members because families know their, their family individual the best. They're going to be able to provide you with some guidance. So what we've got now is some different, um, different scenarios, and you're all sitting at tables. Um, and what I want you to do is turn to page 35, and between pages 35 and 38, there are a couple of different scenarios. And I just want you to work on, with, on a scenario at your table. You can pick whichever one or two you want. Read it, you know, guys decide, read it, and then discuss some of the things that you would do. There are no right or wrong answers to this. This is really where you have to draw from the information we shared this morning, and then your experience in working with um, different individuals. So just take a few moments, decide which one or two scenarios, and then discuss it, and come to some consensus, and then we'll move on. Okay, go ahead. Okay, take a pause. And again, knowing that there's no right or wrong answers, the most important thing is to problem solve it, balance it off of other people, see that there's some diversity amongst our responses. Sometimes we may have read a situation differently than there is. I want you to turn to page 35 now. Mm -hmm. If you're over at the top tier over there, those two tables, you're going to work on situation um, number one. If you are down here, these two tables, you're going to do situation number two. If you're down here at these tables, you're going to do success in the respite environment number three. If you're over there, you're going to do number four. And if you're the tables at the top back, uh, the top tier front and back, yeah, you guys are going to do number five. Success in the respite environment. Just read it and solve it a little bit. Um, with each other. Okay, we're going to take the next step and think about we have looked at um, providing success, we looked at doing some skill building with families. And now I want you to just flip over to page 41, 
And it's going to just give you some ideas. Remember we talked about low cost, no cost ways of doing things, right? That your gift is the gift of your time. There's a whole bunch of activity suggestions here. Um, ones for working with children, including some websites, children with sensory needs, special needs. There's also some ideas of working with individuals with Alzheimer's or dementias or issues related to aging. And what I want you to do is really just um, not read through this. It, it will make more sense once you are matched with the person uh, that you're providing support to. But to think about that, you don't have to have all the answers. And the family doesn't have to draw up a whole itinerary or syllabus of what you're supposed to be doing with the kids or their, their family member or their mother. Uh, but there are resources out there for you. And you can use your respite program staff, you can use the internet, you can use some of the resources here. You can use each other to think about some things that would be successful. And it can be something as simple as getting that person out and taking a walk in the community. Right? Somebody who doesn't, uh, my mother didn't always have the opportunity to get out and take a walk um, because when we were there, we were doing things like laundry and cooking and cleaning. Um, but getting her out, she needed support to walk. And having somebody just take her out for a walk not only gave her fresh air and it was wonderful for her for exercise, it also connected her to her neighbors, right? And people started to see her and see her as a community member again. So there are some activity suggestions here um, on pages 47 and 48. I just want you to take your last few moments with your table mates. You may pick any of the scenarios that you want and discuss it um, amongst the people at your table and come up with some possible ideas about what to do. So you're on pages 47 and 48. Take just about one to two minutes. So we're going to just hit the pause button now and ask if there's any questions that you have about being a respite volunteer that we have covered thus far that seems confusing to you or needs clarification. There are two things that are going to happen um, at this point, which is, or a couple of things, but the two big ones are, you're going to review the volunteer policy and sign off on it, and Jack is going to explain to you next steps as we move um, out of this training and think about how the rest of the care is going to be provided and some different possible avenues, um, and then we'll wrap up. But I wanted to just pause and see if you have any questions. Remember, I'm the mother of many kids, so I can be patient if called upon. Yes? So what if it's the family members or the uh, person that you're helping doing the Snapchatting and the Facebook? Would you with, oh, here's my recipe worker. Is that okay? That's if you're comfortable with it, if you're not comfortable with it, then you can say, um, you know, just for confidentiality reasons, I'd rather not. But yeah, family members can take pictures of their own family members if they want. And that's typically, it's, a, it's a, actually a very good question. That's typically what happens. Is that I see more of the families that I'm Facebook friends with posting pictures of their volunteer with their family member. And I, I don't have it the other way. Yes? Do the families, uh, maybe what I should say, do they have a right? To install a camera in there to make sure that they did not abuse the family. So the question is, does the family have a right to install a camera in their home to ensure that there's not abuse? And there's two sides to this answer. One is not all of the rest of the care that is going to be provided will be provided in a home. So it may be provided in a faith organization, a community center, a respite center. Um, so those will be group settings where, um, a, to a degree, safe sanctuary is practiced where there's uh, no individual would be alone with a caregiver without someone else present or uh, a respite worker. So people would not be one-on-one -on -one in, a, in a closed environment. The other side of that is families have the right to do in their home whatever they feel is necessary to keep their family members safe. So I had cameras installed in my mother's home. They were motion activated. It helped me know when somebody opened the door and the care provider walked in. I got them off of Amazon. I am not a whiz. It just downloaded, like, went to my phone, and that's it. 
I, as a family member, had a responsibility to let that respite worker know that there were cameras in the home. So I could just do it and think, oh, I'm going to catch somebody being bad. I had a responsibility to let them know that there were cameras in my home. So um, yes, family members can do um, those types of activities if they believe that it's good to keep their family members safe. That they should be alerting their, rep, their respite worker or anyone who comes into their home um, to provide care that those things are there. Other questions? So what I'm going to ask you to do now is on page 49 is your volunteer policy. I want you to read it. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Regina, Jack, myself, there are many of us who will come around. If you want to ask us a question privately, if you want to shout it out publicly, you're free to do that too. If you are comfortable with the elements in the volunteer policy, I would like you to go into your left-hand pocket. You will always keep one in your binder in the midsection, but there is one for you to sign and turn in in your left-hand pocket. So I'd like you to do that now. other than you agree, understand, and agree to abide by the policy. So you're going to notice that in your left-hand pocket, everything should be signed or completed except for your post-evaluation survey. And you've also got your index card in there. I want you to take that index card out one more time where you had your contact information on the front and identify the respite scenario um, that you felt would be a comfortable fit for you. And if there's any adjustments or additions or corrections you want to make to that respite scenario, um, now's the time to do it. And again, remembering that it's not contracting you to anything. We're just helping to clarify where you would feel most comfortable giving your gift of time and experience and competence. And if you're okay with that, I'm going to ask you to take out your post-evaluation survey. It is two-sided and complete it. And while I'm doing that, and you're completing your survey, I'm going to turn it over to Jack because I'm sure you may have some questions right now about what are the next steps. And I know page 53 in your um, folder sort of gives you a flow chart, but it's a very general flow chart. And what we want you to do is know that when you hand in your paperwork today and get your certificate, that today isn't the end of something. It's more the beginning of something that I hope will be absolutely a wonderful experience for you. Um, so take a moment, get all of your paperwork together, complete your survey, and Jack is going to share with you where we hope to go from here. Oh, good afternoon again, everybody. Man, that was good lunch. <laughs> Um, first of all, I would love to thank everyone that's here. Thank you for making it. Most especially Mr. Floyd Mosca, you said, Joanne, and Jenny, Jenny, Mr. and Mrs. Adon from Nursing, Executive Director Pam, thank you for sponsoring this respite and bringing Mary Jo up here. Where we're at with this respite is we are in the process because for the, pa for, for the past, we've only been given little funding, which is not enough to be paid for care for, for volunteers, vouchers or stipend. So in this budget, we have been, we've requested for more funding. So hopefully that, that they will be generous enough to approve our request. At the same token, we are working with 
NNC, nursing, RH, and other faith organizations that would do it as a volunteer basis and also make it into a credit arts for you guys. So that's where we're at with this. We are finalizing our MOUs with NMC and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, hopefully I had a talk with Mr. Frederick yesterday from Grace Christian, and he might also possibly have some volunteers for us. So that's where we're at. We are looking. Oh, we also uh, are looking into. Not looking into, but we do have identified an office, a respite care, daycare, not daycare, but center, where they can drop off their loved ones so that, you know, they can receive the respite care there. We're still working out on the number of hours and um, the Depending on funding, that's how much, you know, um, the amount will be given out. So we're looking at maybe a couple of months. Uh, we're doing surveys right now. We have already one that came in from Rhoda. We're still waiting for Tibia. We don't want to leave them out too. But at the same uh, we are looking forward to hopefully starting it off in the next couple of months here in Saipan. So with your help, you know, we're going to really need your help to get this thing going. So, on behalf of our secretary, Robert Hunter, he came earlier, but he had other pressing issues, his budget, and he's meeting with each division. So, he wanted, he asked me to extend his sincere appreciation for your, uh, for your presence today. And hopefully we'll be seeing you guys on our volunteer list. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. And Mary Jo, can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. So now you're going to take all of that stuff in your left hand of your packet, um, put your index card on top with your contact information. That's how we're going to know how to get a hold of you as the respite opportunities unfold. And we have certificates of participation for everyone that you'll need to grab on your way out as you hand in your evaluation materials and paperwork. You'll get your certificate. And I thank you so much for your willingness to spend your Thursday morning and early afternoon with us today. Have a wonderful rest of your, your day. And thank you for welcoming me.